found this uh, primate skull and I want to be able to identify what primate it belongs to. And if we look over some basic facts about primates, um, I'll be able to go off and do that. Luckily, because we have the skull, primate skulls are really easy to identify because each one varies depending on the species. Um, if we look here at four um, examples of skulls of apes, see here the gorilla skull. This is the most robust and the thickest of all the skulls. You can see here the sagittal crest, and this is for attachment of the muscles from the jaw. The jaw muscles are so big, because the jaw is so big, they need that something extra to attach to, and they use the sagittal crest for that. The orangutan also has a slight sagittal crest as well. Also, the orangutan skull slopes back more than any of the others. Um, so the orangutan skull is quite easy to identify. Um, we've also got the gibbon skull. The gibbon is the smallest of all the skulls or out of the apes. Um, there's also more sexual dimorphism between the males and the females. So the skull is the same size. And it's also the roundest out of all the skulls for the apes. Uh, another feature they all have in common is they all have this bony ridge of protection around the eye orbits. Um, it's more defined in some species than in others though. Um, for instance, you can see it's more defined in the gorilla there than it is in the orangutan. And that all of course helps make it easy to identify which the skull, which species the skull belongs to. And if we look now at a, a, an example of a monkey and a lemur, this is actually a howler monkey, and we can tell this because it has this really deep, deep set jaw. Um, we can also tell it's a monkey because it doesn't have this elongated snout that a um, prosimian would have. Um, the face is very flat because smell isn't important to them, unlike the lemur. If we look now. skulls in more detail and in more, with more technical terms now. So we have here in this slide the Hapurines, so that's monkeys and apes together, and on this side we have the Strepsirines, which are the prosimians, the lemurs and the potholes and all of them. Um, the one difference between the Hapurines and the Strepsirines is if I was to take a haplorhine skull and poke my finger into where the eyeball would be, I'd only be able to put my eye in so far before my finger hits um, a bony ridge, a bony wall that would be in there. Whereas with the strepsirhine, I'd be able to put my finger in and it would come out on the other side of this bar here. Uh, in the haplorhine, that's known as the post orbital closure. And in the strips around it's known as the post orbital bar. If we look now at the frontal bone, which is this area here, we can see this line of fusion on the strips around it that goes from the nasal cavity all the way back. And you can see that's missing from the haplorhine. Um, and this is basically just a line of fusion that exists. It's also in the jaw of the strips around it. But again, in the Haplorhine, it's fused and there's no line of fusion there. Actually, in the Strepsorhine, this line of fusion in the, in the jaw, but not in the uh, skull, actually allows for some movement during chewing. So those are the major differences between the Haplorhine and the Strepsorhine skulls. If we look now at this structure, this is the underside of the skull. And it shows the foramen magnum, which is basically a big hole into which the spinal cord passes through. We can tell in this picture this is um, a haplorhine skull because the foramen magnum is in the centre of the skull. If this was a strepsorhine, it would be further back, and that's because when a strepsorhine is stood vertical, when it's stood up, it's not as vertical as a haplorhine would be think of the difference between a lemur standing up and a chimp standing up. The uh, position of the spinal cord would be in a different place and so is the hole into which it needs to pass.
strap. So again, you can tell the difference between haplorhini and strepsorhini that way. If we look now at two examples of two different species of monkeys, we've got here on this side the leaf monkeys and on this side cheek pouch monkeys. Um, so they're both old world monkeys, but there's still some major differences between the two types. So we can still tell differences between the two based upon their skulls. With these, the eye, so eye sockets are further apart than they are for the cheek pouch monkeys are closer together. Also the jaw here is much more deeply set for the leaf monkeys than it is for the cheek pouched monkeys which have a, a smaller jaw there. Also the incisors here are thinner compared to the cheek pouched monkeys. And if we look at the molars of the leaf monkeys we can see that the teeth are rather pointed whereas with the cheek pouched monkeys they're much more rounded. Carrying on with the teeth theme, if we look now at marmosets and tamarinds, these are both um, very small primates that a lot of people have a difficulty telling the difference between. But if you look at the jaws and the teeth, they're quite easy to tell apart. The marmoset is known as a short tusk, um, is known as short tusk because it doesn't have this, these great big canine teeth that the tamarind do. And you can see that again from the side view. If we talk about teeth in general now, um, as you'll know from yourselves being human, primates have two sets of teeth. There's the deciduous milk teeth, and then there's the permanent adult teeth. Um, and when you hear about primate dentition, um, the pattern of the teeth, is referred to in a numerical form and this refers to just one side of the jaw like this picture shows here. Um, if I give you an example then. So a typical dental formula for a new world monkey would be two, one, three, three, two, one, Three, three. So this basically means two incisors, one canine, three premolars, and three molars. And this is repeated on both sides of the same jaw. And for an old world monkey, the dental forming is slightly different. It's two, one, two, three, which again just means two incisors, one canine, this time two premolars, and three molars. And that would be repeated for the other side of the same jaw as well. So this is basically the incisors here, um, rather than being vertical, as they would be in ordinary teeth, they're horizontal, and they're very long and thin as well. And they're used for grooming, as well as for um, stripping out the bark of a tree. And again, that's only in strips around um, so if you find the jaw like that, you know you're looking at a prosimia. Lastly, let's look at some tails. So there's three types of tail. There's the non-prehensile tail, the semi-prehensile tail, and the prehensile tail. The number of vertebrae that are um, in the tail depends upon how prehensile the tail is. So the more prehensile the tail is, the more vertebrae it has. So the non-prehensile tail has fewer vertebrae than the semi-prehensile tail, 
which has fewer vertebrae than the prehensile tail. The level of um, the tail being pre prehensile also determines the location of the longest vertebrae within all of the vertebrae. And here that's represented by the coloured in vertebrae. So you can see in the non prehensile tail, it's further toward this side. Um, so if this is the base of the tail and this is the tip of the tail, you can see in the non prehensile tail, the longest vertebrae is nearer to the base than it is in the semi prehensile tail. And in the prehensile tail, it's really quite close to the tip of the tail. So with all these factors in mind, I can go off and I can look at this primate skull that I came across. I should be able to identify what species it belongs to. So I'm going to go off and do that now.